And welcome back to those of you who were with us yesterday. Um, for those of you who weren't, I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank and a registered 501c3. Uh, we're based in Philadelphia and we bring expert analysis uh, on international affairs and national security to what has become a worldwide audience and our partners. Um, first, let me thank our partners and members for their generous support. And we could not bring programs like this to you without without our partners and our supporters. Um, we have a, um, yesterday our program focused on Taiwan and Hong Kong, and this morning we're going further afield uh, to talk about China's influence in Africa and Eurasia. And we have with us um, uh, David Shin, Joshua Eisenman, and Chris Miller, our own uh, Chris Miller, who's the um, program uh, director of FPRI's Eurasia program. Our moderator this morning uh, will be Jacques Delisle. Uh, Jacques is the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law, uh, Professor of Political Science, and the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also, most importantly to us, the director of FPRI's Asia program. He's the author of a recent book to get Rich is Glorious, Challenges Facing China's Economic Reform and Opening at 40, which he co-edited with Avery Goldstein. Uh, his articles have appeared in many scholarly journals and edited volumes. He uh, received his JD in graduate education in political science at Harvard. Um, a few little housekeeping uh, matters. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see the chat button. If you click on that, you will open a screen on the right uh, in which you can put your questions that you would like to have answered because we'll have a question and answer period toward the end of the program this morning. Um, again, thank you for joining us um, and uh, as Jacques will explain, our programs this week are based on really an update to the articles that were in the spring edition of Orbis. And if you don't know Orbis, it, it's our uh, quarterly journal. Uh, it goes to universities both in this country and worldwide. Uh, so it's on the syllabi in many, many universities, as well as the um, the service academies and the war colleges in the United States. So please check out Orbis. And if you become a member at a certain level, you will get it for free. So uh, please consider doing that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jacques. Well, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us either for the first time today or uh, for the second time in what will be our four-part series. As uh, Raleigh mentioned, this is based on a special issue of Orbis, which focused on political warfare in and from East Asia, and we've gathered together as people to speak particularly uh, to various aspects of China's uh, role on that front. Uh, again, yesterday we talked about China's very near periphery, what China considers part of China, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, and today we're going to go to very far-flung areas, Africa and Eurasia. Uh, this is obviously being uh, broadcast live, but the uh, video will be posted on YouTube. You can link through the FPRI website uh, to that. So what we have uh, today is, again, this, this uh, much uh, broader uh, geographic uh, perspective. We have a terrific crew assembled to address it. Uh, in one case, authors of an article that did appear in Orbis. In another case, uh, someone who can speak to those issues uh, in one area we didn't get to in, in the Orbis. Uh, issue. So let me just briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll, we'll turn to our uh, discussion. Um, again, uh, we'll run for a chunk of our hour uh, with the panelists speaking and, and questions and answers, uh, comments among us, and we'll turn it open uh, to the audience. Please put your questions in the chat function and we'll get to those. So first, uh, first of all, we have with us Ambassador David Chin, who teaches at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Before that, he spent 37 years in the U.S. Foreign Service with a number of postings in Africa and on the Africa desk, uh, various Africa desks in the State Department. He also served as U.S. Ambassador to Burkina Faso and Ethiopia, and he writes widely on Africa issues, of course, but also specifically on China-Africa relations. Uh, his work has appeared in many academic journals. He blogs on the subject. He also has some terrific stuff that's uh, been in China file on China-Africa issues. 
Uh, his co-author uh, for the piece that appeared in Orbis is Joshua Eisenman. Josh is associate professor at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he is, his work has appeared in many of the journals that people who watch uh, international relations and the China field read regularly, Foreign Affairs, the Journal of Contemporary China, the China Journal of Foreign Policy, uh, and then pieces in the media, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, things of that ilk. Uh, he is also a senior fellow for China Studies at the American uh, Foreign Policy Committee. Uh, both of our authors, uh, uh, both of our co-authors of the Orbis piece are also co-authors in more extended treatments of these subjects. Ambassador Shin and Professor Eisenman are co-authors of China and Africa, A Century of Engagement, which was named one of the top three books on Africa by Foreign Affairs when it came out in 2012. And they have a new book, uh, which I think includes some of the work that showed up in the Orbis article on China-Africa political and security relations. Our other panelist today is Chris Miller. My colleague here at FPRI, Chris, directs the Eurasia program at FPRI and is an assistant professor of uh, international history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, and he is the author of a bunch of works on contemporary Russia. But before he went into academics, he was, before he went into Tufts anyway, he was a lecturer uh, and researcher at various places like the uh, uh, New Economic School in Moscow, the Carnegie Center in Moscow, and the German Marshall Funds Transatlantic. Uh, program. Uh, he's the author of Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia and the Struggle to Save the Soviet Union's Economy. Uh, he's written on uh, many things, but of particular interest today, he's written on uh, the China's Belt and Road Initiative and the American Interest, uh, and uh, Russia is an Asian Power, something that appeared in War on the Rocks, uh, both, uh, both uh, places to go for interesting issues, interesting uh, writing on issues in, in uh, regional and foreign affairs. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's uh, uh, get to it. Just a little bit of, of framing here. Um, we talked about this last time, I'm sure we'll revise it, but we're talking about political warfare and its cousin, uh, soft power. Uh, one of the classic definitions of political warfare is uh, George Kennan's, which says it's the logical application of Clausewitz's doctrine, that is the continuation of politics through other means, uh, in time of peace. It includes the use of all means short of war to achieve national objectives, uh, political, economic, information, diplomatic means, uh, and it exists somewhere, sharp power at least, exists somewhere on the continuum from hard power, uh, the use of military coercion, uh, to soft power or persuasion and uh, transactional economic deals. Uh, it's all part of a spectrum, as I think we'll see in our discussion today, uh, China's engagement with its far abroad, with Africa uh, and Eurasia, has uh, elements that exist along that uh, entire spectrum. So with, with uh, that bit of uh, business out of the way, let me turn to uh, Ambassador Shin and Professor Eisenman and, and say, how would you characterize China's approach to Africa and how it has evolved over time? I think uh, people who are uh, closer to Ambassador Shin's age and mine <laughs> and they are to our other panelists will recall the days when uh, China was all about the Bandung Line, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, uh, this sort of strong sovereignty non-interference doctrine. To what extent does that still persist today and to the extent it's changed, how has it changed? Uh, Ambassador Chin or, or, or Josh wants to speak to that first. Ambassador Chin. Yes. Sure, Jacques, let me uh, begin. And this is a question that's not specifically addressed in the Orbis article. We can come back to that a little bit later perhaps. But if you look at uh, the, the China-Africa relationship historically, it really has changed fairly dramatically over time. Uh, back in the, in the late 50s, uh, throughout the 60s, into the 70s, the focus was on support for liberation movements. It was ideological. Uh, it was uh, very much Cold War politics, uh, Sino-Soviet split, uh, all kinds of issues that today are are largely irrelevant. Uh, it moved through a transition phase in the 70s, 80s, and by the time you got into the 90s, uh, it was really primarily a focus on an economic relationship and China's much improved economy, its interest in expanding trade and investment, uh, financing in Africa, and that's largely what it's about today, although it's taken on a much more recent security interest which is, uh, is a fascinating development, a relatively recent one. But it's a, very, it's a very new kind of relationship, which is heavily economically focused, and particularly on the issue of um, financing of infrastructure projects, which is what you read about widely in the press, particularly. Uh, these are loans, they're not grants, and uh, they do raise debt issues, uh, which is a very important issue for Africa today. 
particularly in the aftermath of uh, coronavirus and the impact that that is having on not only the economy of China, but the economy of the African countries too. Uh, so it's, it's quite an evolution of, uh, of policy. Uh, as I say, that doesn't really get us into the Orbis article, but uh, perhaps Josh wants to lead into that. Uh, well, thanks, Ambassador uh, That was great. I really uh, appreciate that introduction. Maybe I'll just make a couple of complimentary comments. Um, I think that one thing that we should remember is how important domestic politics has been in terms of uh, influencing Chinese foreign policy. And that has been um, certainly evident in the China-Africa relationship, whereas earlier, especially during the more uh, radical Maoist periods, China was engaged in all matters of in interference or what would be now considered interference. And it cost it relationships during that period. And that is in part, uh, a large part due to what was going on in China domestically. Um, as China evolved in the 1970s and 80s into a more, um, I would say, uh, stable um, and less radical uh, domestic policy, that also influenced its policy towards Africa, which also became commiserately less um, uh, um, aggressive and radical. Um, and so the transition that Ambassador Shin is rightly pointing out, um, I just want to add that there is an important domestic component to what's going on. Now, what brings us really full circle to where we are today is that um, the initial engagement that China and Africa had was deeply political um, and military. Um, China was providing military aid uh, to push back against primarily colonial regimes or white supremacist regimes in uh, Rhodesia and South Africa. And so there was a deep political component and almost no economic component. As Ambassador Shin rightfully points out, that has evolved into a very strong economic component. However, what we are seeing now, and what is one of the reasons Ambassador Shin and I are turning back to this topic, which is, uh, I think, fascinating, is what um, has been noted as a kind of peak China-Africa economic relationship, where the trade relationship is not, uh, has not grown significantly over the last five years, um, and it looks like China is being more um, risk-averse in terms of large investments, um, uh, or that would be, I guess, large debt financing projects, being more circum, uh, uh, more thoughtful, shall we say, on that issue. And so we see a turn back then to uh, politics and military relations becoming increasingly important. And so I think that that's where this historical question that Jock points out is particularly important and valid because we do see, um, I wouldn't say a coming full circle because the economic relationship is, is really important. It's essential. It will remain so. But a kind of plateauing of that relationship and a rapid expansion in terms of political engagement through the Communist Party of China's International Department um, and through different soft power means um, that Jock was talking about, um, we see that going on more and more. Um, so I think that that's a, an important kind of uh, 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 kind of a circle that we are now, uh, I would say, engaged. So one of the uh, things that you do bring out in the article is that for uh, a long time, once we, you know, well, sort of before and after uh, the more radical Maoist periods, uh, China had pushed this this non-interference, this sovereignty emphasis with what were essentially post-colonial countries, right? Countries moving out of colonial domination, moving into uh, independence. And one of the things that comes through in a lot of the discussion of Chinese political warfare or sharp power, uh, especially when we're talking about targeting uh, democracies in, in, in Europe or Australasia or the United States, is this essentially mucking around in internal affairs, right? And China, of course, has long complained that the U.S. has mucked around in its internal affairs. But those questions, are, are they not especially, have they not been especially fraught in Africa? I mean, there's this real sensitivity to interference, and China's at least rhetorical position has been non-interference, sovereignty, we're not like those European or even American powers. Um, is, has, was that important in the Chinese mix? And although it's still at least um, it officially and in policy statements a big deal, has it faded in, in, in reality and, and what's replaced it? I mean, the Xi Jinping is, is nothing if not a master of slogans about how to, to engage with uh, countries around the world. Well, you're right, Jacques, that has traditionally been a key theme in the uh, relationship between China and Africa. And as you say, rhetorically, it still is today. Rhetorically, it is unchanged. Uh, it still is official uh, Chinese uh, policy towards Africa. What has changed, however, is the facts on the ground are changing as, as China becomes more engaged in Africa, as it has greater interests, as it has more people living and working in Africa as, it, as these individuals encounter 
more risk and, and sometimes threats of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, subject to kidnappings, killings, uh, ordinary crime, uh, occasionally terrorist attacks. China has found that it has to take uh, more vigorous action in order to protect its interests. So the rhetoric hasn't really changed, but the, the actual policy has been evolving. And that's one of the reasons you see the new military base in Djibouti, for example. Uh, but that's only the most obvious manifestation of it. If you look across the continent, you see where, where China is becoming more robust in its uh, handling of any threat towards its people or its interests. Um, but the rhetoric has not changed. So among the, uh, the, the cracks in that old uh, position that, uh, that are, are much noted and that you go into some in the article, uh, obviously Djibouti military base, as you say, is a high profile one, but we have China softening its position on Darfur. Uh, that is you know, saying that, that what goes on in Darfur inside what was then one Sudan uh, was a legitimate area of international concern. We see China at least uh, initially uh, acquiescing in intervention in Libya, although it, it later kind of revised its judgment in, in light of what it saw as, as, as mission overreach. Um, are those kind of uh, markers for a, a, a new Chinese approach along the lines that you're talking about, or are they more uh, sui generis cases? Uh, some of them are probably sui generis. Uh, others, I think, do indicate a, uh, a trend, a, a change for the future. For example, China has publicly professed to be more interested in uh, trying to mediate disputes in Africa. And on a few occasions, uh, as you suggested, in Darfur was, was actually uh, involved in that kind of activity. Uh, in South Sudan and the civil war there, uh, it initially tried to mediate, uh, didn't have much success, backed away fairly quickly. Uh, it has professed a desire to mediate in places like uh, the border dispute between Djibouti and Eritrea, uh, the problems between Ethiopia and Eritrea that in the final analysis did not do that. But this is all sort of new initiative, new activity by China, even though it only goes up to a point. And China's definition of mediation is not exactly the Western definition of mediation. They take a rather different approach to it. Uh, it's still more risk averse. It's, uh, I think, reluctant to get involved because it does smack of, uh, and internal involvement uh, in issues in Africa. And it, it still is trying to hold to that principle. But Josh may want to add in on this point. Josh? Well, the only thing I think I would add is that there's, a, I guess, a distinction to make here uh, between those initiatives which are, as you say, you know, for example, the Libya case where China more or less acquiesced to the international community versus the Zimbabwe case where there have been, you know, pretty, it seems, credible rumors and discussion about the relationship that China had in that transition. And I think that there's a difference here between um, these kinds of interventions, right? Is China helping to um, bring some resolution to the Darfur issue to the good? Um, or is it essentially in some way influencing leadership transitions in African countries, right? And I think that we should distinguish between different types of interventions. Um, and of course, the protection of civilians on the ground, the protection of economic interests, um, you know, these things are somewhat different, although not entirely separate from uh, basing issues, right? Um, in many ways, they form a pretext for basing issues, um, but are not entirely overlapping. So um, I, I think that it's, it's highly possible we will see another Chinese base on the African continent, perhaps on the Western Sea, uh, Western side of the continent. And um, so I, I think this is a trajectory that we should expect to continue, right? That we would expect to see China becoming more engaged politically and militarily on the continent in ways that in the past might have um, been considered in the 70s interference, but have now evolved into um, a, a position that China can argue non-interference but still engage in these policies. Yeah, I, I wanna uh, switch over to Chris for a moment here. So we've been discussing how China's approach to countries that were at the time of the initial engagement newly independent or just becoming independent and how it's now uh, started to uh, be deeply engaged in ways that draw it into domestic politics. 
Uh, so, so Chris, in the part of Eurasia that is nearest China, we have a similar phenomenon, right? The, at least in a, in a very uh, general way. That is, you have uh, the former Soviet republics that became independent states along China's periphery. Uh, what's, what's been China's in, engagement there uh, where you do have kind of Russia looming in the background in a way that the European colonial powers and, and the United States don't quite so much in Africa? I think that is a crucial difference between Africa and Eurasia. Um, in, in Africa, China is very happy, I think, to see a, a reduction in the influence of other powers. Whereas in Eurasia, Russia has to t uh, China has to take, I'm sorry, a, a more measured approach because ultimately the, the great goal for um, China in Eurasia is good relations with Russia rather than good relations with the smaller countries. The smaller countries are not unimportant, but Russia is obviously uh, the other great power in the region. And so everything that China's done in Central Asia has been uh, managed in a way so as to make sure that Russia doesn't get too uncomfortable. And of course, if you think about the region from Russia's perspective, uh, it's in some ways surprising that Russia hasn't been more uncomfortable by everything that China has done. Russia, of course, sees Central Asia, uh, the five uh, Central Asian states of the former Soviet Union as its historic backyard. It's been the dominant a player in those states, the dominant foreign power for over 150 years. And even in places like Afghanistan, Russia, of course, has uh, deep uh, historical interests that, that today it feels ought to be recognized by outside powers. So when China uh, tries to expand its role in, in Central Asia and Afghanistan and other parts of Eurasia, it needs to operate very carefully to avoid not offending the Russians or not convincing Russia that it's a threat. And I think the interesting part about Chinese diplomacy is that it's been actually extraordinarily successful in doing this because there's no doubt that China's footprint uh, in Central Asia has expanded drastically uh, over the past couple of decades and in particular over the past couple of years. And yet it's managed to do this without really angering the Russians in a serious way and in many ways actually uh, leaving um, at least part of the Russian policymaking class uh, thinking that in fact an expanded Russian footprint in Central Asia is actually not threatening Russia's interests. There is some debate in this on Russia, uh, but in some ways I think we, we ought to be surprised by how tactful Chinese diplomacy has been in managing this issue. Hey, thanks. I want to turn back to uh, Ambassador Shin and, and, and Josh now, which is um, we've seen uh, uh, China sort of trying to frame its uh, current approach to much of the outside world in what sound like very non-threatening terms. And uh, Chris has just told us how it's sort of been surprising how unthreatening in a way Russia has seen uh, China's behavior in its, in its inland uh, near abroad. But if we look at, at what China says more generally, and, and your article in Orbis goes into this, we're now seeing phrases like the China dream, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, probably most uh, touted or most emphasized uh, phrase as well, as well as the phrase, it's a little more difficult to translate, but uh, the, uh, the uh, com community of shared future, community of common destiny. Um, obviously, those are rhetorical shifts and they come on on uh, the heels of, of what uh, Xi's predecessors have raised, you know, a harmonious world from Hu Jintao, uh, a peaceful rise, uh, you know, Zhang Bijian's contribution to Zhang Zemin era. So, you know, what do those mean in the African context? What do, how does it translate into Chinese engagement with Africa? Uh, to to uh, putting to be putting these foreign policy agendas under those those kinds of phrases does does it signal anything of significance and if so, uh, what? Uh, Ambassador Shen? Yeah, well, I, I would make a distinction between the community of shared value and the uh, the Chinese dream. Uh, the, the community of shared value I think is seen as a totally benign, acceptable uh, phrase, a theme that the Africans can go along with and say, sure, sure, that we're all part of that too. Yes, yes. Uh, where can we sign the next loan form? Uh, that's really what their interest is in the final analysis. It's, um, it's not the, the rhetoric of the community of shared values, but they certainly have no objection to it. And there may be a few African leaders who even find it to be a perfectly acceptable and desirable kind of link between uh, China and uh, a particular African country. The Chinese dream theme is, has been harder to um, accept. And, in Africa because I don't really think they understand what the relevance of it is for Africa. And China has tried to link it to the African dream. Well, the Africans are not quite sure what the African dream is. Uh, so here you've got sort of two, two themes being used that are really not clear to the population in Africa 
And again, the, the Africans have no objection to their Chinese dream. If the Chinese wanted a dream, that's just great. But what's the relevance to Africa is what they basically ask themselves. I, I find that it has not really resonated on the continent. The only, uh, uh, yeah, the only thing I'd like to add to that is that I think this is another indication of the political shift we've seen in China. Because the Chinese dream, I would consider to be a national socialist dream. It's a Chinese only dream. It's an exclusionary dream. It's not for people who are not Chinese. And um, so it is not an open dream. And um, by definition, then, it doesn't appeal to non-Chinese people. Um, and it, um, it, it suggests um, that China is trying to enhance its comprehensive national strength. And it is a dream of leadership under the Communist Party of China. So um, that is not a dream, I think, that for the reasons Ambassador Shin well articulated, is very appealing for Africans or, 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 or anybody else outside of China. Uh, for that matter. But I would also juxtapose that in the past with Maoism, right? Um, Maoism um, and the Maoists uh, uh, is an international worker peasant alliance, right? It is an internationalist uh, uh, communist leftist uh, vision. But, but the nation, but, but the, uh, the the Chinese dream, as it is at this point, I would consider a rightist idea. It is a, a exclusionary idea. It is not open. It's not an alliance. Um, it is simply that China should uh, receive its revanchist claims and China should uh, thrive. And that's important for China, but it is not open for others. The community of shared destiny um, I, for mankind, I think for the reason that Ambassador Shin said is uh, something people can sign on to, but they don't much know what it means or how it impacts them um, in, in, in any significant way. So um, I'm not sure that's a great victory for Beijing if people sign things just to sign them to get to the next loan uh, agreement, right? Is that, a, is that a successful political agenda? Um, I think that in Beijing, they have to consider whether um, that it, that's what they're looking for. Um, and so I think that it's important to have this juxtaposition between uh, what we started off talking about, which was the Chinese in, in political engagement in the early years versus its current political engagement, which is uh, perhaps not as appealing uh, um, you know, on its face. And it's more the economics that are driving uh, the interest from the African side. So there, there are a couple of questions that have come in that I think uh, follow on uh, what you've just been talking about and that, that uh, loop back to the general theme of the Orbis issue. And I want to pose this first on the Africa question and on the Eurasia question, which is when we think of political warfare and sharp power, it's often about mucking around inside other countries' domestic politics, trying to pursue uh, certain agendas. So we've got some things in the question box about Africa. Uh, for instance, you know, aren't, when, when China is dealing as it does in Africa, isn't it, it in effect supporting incumbent regimes in power in a variety of ways? Some of those regimes you know, have their own domestic opponents, and this is potentially a, a tool for dealing with that. And we've also got a question about you know, China's role in, in infrastructure, including communications infrastructure. We talked about the uh, political uses of economic leverage. Uh, so those are the kinds of discussion one hears about what China is up to in, in much of, uh, of the world. Certainly, it's near abroad. Um, do you, and, and certainly across the Indian Ocean, you know, Sri Lanka ports and all that sort of stuff. To what extent do you see that kind of thing going on in Africa? That is, China is, um, despite the continued rhetoric of non-interference and sovereignty, it is in fact using a variety of tools, political connections, political agendas, and the economic leverage that comes with some of these uh, investments and that comes with diplomatic support as well as other backing uh, for leaders in Africa. Is, is this part of the story? And if so, how would you characterize it or answer these, these uh, questions we've got from our audience? Yeah, that, and that does take us into the heart of the, uh, the Orbis article and something that we, we covered that, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been covered anywhere else. Uh, in other words, I would make a distinction between uh, what we identified as six core Chinese interests that are not necessarily particularly relevant to Africa. And I'll come back to that. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis other more generic concerns that the state of the United States has about support for democratization, human rights, good governance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, China by and large avoids those generic issues that the US feels very strongly about. And that's where we get into this debate as to whether there are political strings attached to what the U.S. does, uh, and China argues there are no political strengths to what it does. Well, that's not totally accurate, but uh, that takes us to these six core uh, Chinese interests that you would think would not 
resonate in Africa. The six are essentially uh, the issue of a recognition of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, Beijing, uh, human rights issues generically, Tibet, uh, treatment of Muslim minorities in uh, China, the South China Sea and Hong Kong. These are all core issues. Now, of those six, only two really have much direct impact for Africa. The, the Taiwan recognition question, because if you recognize Taiwan, obviously you will have no, uh, no formal links with Beijing. So that's, a, that's something that the African countries have to make a decision on. And the other one is the human rights generic question for the simple reason that both China and a significant number of African countries have their own human rights issues. And it gets to be a question of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours uh, in say the UN Human Rights Council. So there the Africans have a, a, a direct interest in, in two of the issues. But if you take the other four, Tibet, um, Muslim minorities in, in China, South China Sea and Hong Kong, you know, most Africans would yawn uh, if you brought that up. But the Chinese don't yawn. They, this is a big deal for them. And as a result, they go to great efforts in Africa to either one, get African silence on them, which they have achieved totally in the last 10 years minimum, or better to get Chinese or to get African support for those issues. And they have been surprisingly effective at getting African support on all of those issues. And that is a, um, is a, is a key distinction between how the U.S. looks at at uh, political conditionality and China looks at political conditionality. Josh, you wanna please? I would say uh, only two quick uh, uh, points. I would say that one issue that we talked about in the, in the uh, manuscript that I think is worth noting is the issue of the Muslim minorities in Western China, because of course um, there are on the African continent numerous states which um, are either majority Muslim or have large minority Muslim populations. And so in some places, um, Egypt for instance, there has been some kind of agitation and irritation at the grassroots level. It hasn't necessarily materialized into anything, but there were kind of these weapons of the week, these grassroots rumors. For instance, um, at, the, at the outbreak of COVID-19, there was a rumor that was rampant in Arabic and in North Africa, African states, as I was told by several African diplomats in the area, that this was a punishment for the mistreatment of Muslims, right? Linking the issues together in a way um, which now, which is, you know, obviously ridiculous, but is reminiscent of a kind of weapons of the weak approach uh, because on the uh, official level, as Ambassador Shin rightly points out, there is no pushback. In fact, with the issue of Muslims, you have African countries, dozens of them, signing on agreements in support of China's policies in Xinjiang. Um, to my knowledge, and I may be wrong about this at this point, I don't know of any African country that is specifically publicly pushed back against. Them. So um, you can really get a sense here of how uh, little uh, African countries are engaged in these issues, which as Ambassador Shin rightly points out, are uh, China's domestic core interests. Um, and in fact, they're easy for African countries to say yes to because they don't really have an effect on the Dalai Lama is not an important player in most African countries. And so it's a, it's an easy yes, um, but it means a lot to China. Um, and it's an important signal to China that, uh, that you're on board um, with them politically. I mean, it truly has been striking how quiet uh, majority Muslim nations around the world have been on Xinjiang. I mean, Turkey made a, a brief, uh, a mild squawk officially, and then, then, you know, whether we're talking uh, neighbors in Asia or, or countries in Africa or across the Middle East, it really has been uh, not a lot of, uh, of outrage on behalf of, of co-religionists and indeed some statements that are quite, uh, quite uh, laudatory of, of uh, what China's been doing in Xinjiang. Jacques, can I add one more quick sure. point? Um, there is, and I wouldn't say this is imminent, but it's, it's a consideration. If, if China does begin to engage um, in, in things that are, might be considered interference, right? And we do see some African authors who have asked this question and we, we quote them in our paper. Um, then there could be a concern going forward that, that if China is seen to be engaging in influencing African internal affairs, that African countries may become less willing to toe the line or remain silent on China's internal affairs. I'm not sure that's about to happen because it's just not that important to them as an issue, but it is a, it, it is a kind of a lurking problem if China does become really engaged in ways that, uh, that develop serious pushback. 
um, there could be a, a, a stirring of the pot effect, although I have not seen that uh, yet. I want to turn to, to Chris on some of these questions. Um, and uh, Chris has talked about, a, a, obviously, uh, an area which is internally diverse on these things. But if you go to the Western uh, periphery or the near Western periphery of, of Eurasia, some of these same concerns are voiced. Right? A lot of pressure on Eastern and Central European countries uh, to align with China's views on some of the very same core interests that Ambassador Shen and Josh have uh, both been discussing. So how, how strong do you think that pressure is from uh, China and what are the domestic political consequences in countries that do have democratic politics, including democratic politics about foreign policy? Yeah, I think that's a, a great way of framing it because one of the things you, you do see across Eurasia is a very different response in Central Asia to Central and Eastern Europe, which I guess you would probably uh, imagine given the differences in domestic politics. But in an issue like Xinjiang in particular, in many ways it's, it's Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, and other countries in Central Asia that have the most at stake because there are ethnic Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, uh, people who have family members in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan getting uh, getting rounded up and put in uh, detention camps in uh, Western China. But what's I think striking about uh, Central Asia is that with only a small number of exceptions, the governments of those countries have really adhered to the Chinese government's line um, at some cost domestically. There have been some uh, publicly driven protests against uh, China's policies in Xinjiang, but the governments of Central Asia have been very quiet. If you turn to, to Europe and, and the countries that, as Jacques mentioned, uh, have, have been under increasing pressure from Beijing to the line on Xinjiang, on Tibet, on Hong Kong, on Taiwan, I think what you find over the past couple of years is a, a shift where five or 10 years ago, it was not very costly domestically to be cozying up to Beijing. Uh, and there were at least perceived benefits on the economic front of having good relations with China, even if it required um, following China's uh, foreign policy lines on, on some of these uh, key issues. But over the past couple of um, years and really the past couple of months, we've seen a, a marked shift in a number of countries where there's growing concern about Chinese interference, uh, where a number of politicians, most recently in the Czech Republic, have taken up Taiwan as an issue with which um, to attack their domestic opponents for being too cozy with Beijing. Uh, there's an interesting, I think, resuscitation of uh, the dislike of communism uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, there's the long history of disliking Soviet communism, and that's been relatively easy to uh, repackage as a sort of anti-Chinese Communist Party um, rhetoric too. But I think it's not surprising that you see this pushback in Central and Eastern Europe because China's been so aggressive uh, in demanding that Central and Eastern European countries follow Beijing's line on these key issues. It, in some ways, I think what's striking is actually uh, how poorly China has managed the democracies of, of Europe. And I think this is perhaps not surprising given that uh, Chinese diplomats don't, uh, aren't, don't come up in democratic societies and aren't used to how these types of polities operate. They're more comfortable in authoritarian contexts because that's their own context. Um, but I think it, it is quite interesting how Chinese diplomats, I think, have been blindsided by the backlash you see in countries from Sweden to the Czech Republic from all across Europe to their uh, types of tactics, which are interpreted as being bullying, uh, as being interference, uh, as being the types of things that China says it doesn't do, but in reality has done repeatedly across Europe. And uh, Chris and I were at a, an event in, in Vilnius uh, several months ago. One thing that struck me there, and see if, if Chris agrees with this, is for those European democracies that are right up against Eurasian authoritarian regimes, uh, there, it's, it's partly communism, but it's also partly, hey, you know, China's role here, be it BRI or diplomatically, is kind of aligned with Russia. Uh, and kind of backing some of these authoritarian regimes. And if you're the last democratic state before you cross that line, there's a particular uh, concern about that kind of Russia-China authoritarian alignment, especially where it gets uh, into having impacts on one's own domestic policies, where the money seems to be flowing next door, but not to me. Um, and that there really was this switch from, we'd like to be part of the BRI too, we'd like that money to come in to saying, wait a second, we're a little worried about, about the alignment here. We're not getting much money and we're feeling the political pressure. Very much so. And I think both of those, those last two factors that you mentioned are actually quite important. The political pressure has definitely increased the past couple of years. And at the same time, there's a growing gap between China's rhetoric about handing out loans to all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the reality that only a small number of countries have seen projects of any size. And, and those that have, have 
I had a whole variety of domestic debates about whether in fact the money is being well spent, whether there's corruption involving those contracts. So I think uh, in many places where there was optimism about Chinese investment a decade ago or even five years ago, today that's been replaced by a whole lot of skepticism. And you see that across the region. Right. So we just put it in so you just put in the, in the chat box a question of Serbia, which of course is leaning very much to China in, in this discussion. So I think you do see these these relatively you know, the sort of newly independent states, Central East European states. You see them uh, being pulled in both directions, and then you know, some go one way, some go the other way, and it often has to do with the robustness of their their transition. I think. Well, in Serbia also, if you if you think of how it looks from Serbia's perspective, they're trying to push the EU into opening up a, a more rapid accession process. And so Serbia has every incentive to uh, act like best friends with Beijing as a reminder to Europe that if you don't let us in sooner rather than later, we have other options. There's a sort of game theory going on here with Serbia. I'm sorry, uh, was it Josh or Master Chen who wanted to weigh in? Josh, yeah. I wanted to just make a quick comment. In addition to this um, issue of the kind of bloom coming off the rose, I think another trend is that we're seeing um, grassroots discontents beginning to leak into elite level politics. And this is particularly relevant with regard to the Guangzhou incidents. And this circles back to the issue of human rights. Um, I'm not sure that Africans care much about the human rights situation within China, although I don't want to speak for all Africans. That's certainly not my intent. But, um, but when Africans in Guangzhou were being mistreated and kicked out of their homes and sleeping under bridges, that mistreatment of them, that human rights issue, which is not covered in our paper because it's so recent, I think then pushed into the elite realm and we saw some Chinese ambassadors getting pulled in in Nigeria being made from African elites that we hadn't heard before. So I think that in addition to this point that Chris makes, which is really important, of a bit of um, maybe disappointment sometimes um, in the actual outcomes after the flowery MOUs and everything, you kind of MOU uh, a disappointment, but I think we're also seeing this trend moving from uh, a grassroots discontent into elite level um, having to kind of at least be responsive or seem to be responsive um, when those things happen to Africans, particularly in the Guangzhou. What's interesting on that point, though, is that with the exception of Nigeria, uh, I'm not aware of any African government that has continued to press this point. They About half a dozen of them came out initially, which was a great surprise, and were critical of China and its handling of, of the African community in Guangzhou. And then it, after about a week, it disappeared and it hasn't come back, with the exception of Nigeria. So my guess is that there was a fair amount of pressure brought to bear by Chinese embassies around Africa that, look, don't push this issue anymore. This is, uh, this is not going to get you additional loans. So, so drawing on a, on a couple of uh, questions that have come in in the, uh, in the, the question box is sort of are the flip of what you're talking about. So we talked about the uh, limited pushback we've gotten from Muslim majority nations in Africa on Xinjiang. We've talked about the uh, incipient but but still limited pushback we've gotten on Chinese mistreatment of Africans in China. Uh, what about the impact of China's presence in Africa in terms of African publics and to some extent government's reactions to China? So we hear things like they're taking all the jobs, uh, you know, this is a terrible uh, uh, a situation for African workers who are working for Chinese companies if Chinese workers aren't displacing them. Uh, we somebody put a put a, a, a note in the chat box here about being in Addis Ababa when the uh, coronavirus broke out, and the joke was uh, that there's nothing to worry about because the virus is made in China, so it will fall apart within two weeks at most. I mean, this is kind of sentiment uh, that is uh, has a not very rosy view of of China in Africa. Is that? something that is affecting China's ability to uh, pursue its diplomatic and, and political agenda in Africa? Do you see that kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, criticism or skepticism building? Well, it, it is an issue for China. Uh, again, you have to make a distinction between African civil society, where this is coming from, and African governments, uh, which tend to suppress it almost universally. The other interesting side of this issue and we're starting to see this, uh, at least I'm starting to see it for the first time in Africa, when you have Chinese in Africa who are kidnapped or killed or robbed or whatever, uh, some Africans are noticing there really isn't any outcry about that, that uh, there's this huge outcry when, when Africans are abused in Guangzhou, but 
when Chinese are abused in Africa, there tends to be silence. And it's a very interesting new development that, um, that merits watching. I think uh, if I would just add a couple of things to that, I, I think that I would broadly categorize what Jock mentioned as kind of burgeoning anti-Chinese resistance narratives. And of course, this is, as Chris mentioned, with regard to Central Asia, linked to anti-foreign resistance narratives to go back to colonialism, the othering, right? There's, there's a extensive l academic literature on, on this. So to some degree, um, Chinese, by the fact that they look different, are easily singled out. And we saw that in the United States. Um, you know, this kind of um, anti-Chinese racism is, is not unique to Africa. Uh, are, right. Um, but I think what changes it here is that China is so powerful vis-a-vis -vis these African countries that it takes on a different dynamic um, than, for example, what happened in San Francisco where, uh, uh, you know, many years ago. So um, I, I feel that, um, you know, this is a burgeoning anti-Chinese resistance narratives. As I said a moment ago, this is only really getting started. And on Twitter, it's far more virulent um, than I had realized until I started following a lot of people who are. So there is actually quite a, a community of concern. Um, and interestingly enough, they're using Chinese cell phones. A lot of them are off Huawei networks uh, tweeting out anti-Chinese narratives. It's, it, it's actually quite interesting in that way, the irony of it all. Um, but I think that it, it's important to recognize that it's in part this stirring of the pot underneath that is pushing um, uh, folks above to at least seem to be responsive at the initial outbreak of the Guangzhou incident. And uh, Ambassador Shin is right that it seemed to kind of go away relatively quickly. Um, but the fact is, I still think that it was a, uh, a watershed moment that it happened in the first place, um, because it hadn't really happened before. Okay, so we're uh, burning through our time here, which is a terrific conversation, but I do want to make sure we get a chance to address uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI specifically. Uh, so we've got a question on the European side, which I'm going to pose to Chris, and then we'll, we'll swing back to the African issues. Um, so, uh, Chris, we have a question about what about Greece? Um, and I think, in a sense, Greece is the microcosm for this question, right? It's the Piraeus port deal that, that generally drives this. But there is this, this uh, cluster of countries that is the sort of eastern edge of the European Union, uh, spilling over into countries that would like to be part of the EU. Uh, they're sort of at the, at the fringe, although who knows what's happening to the EU these days? That's a subject for another question another day. Um, but, but how would you characterize, and again, it's obviously going to vary country to country, but how would you characterize the reading of uh, BRI, the, the arguments over it, uh, particularly at the EU fringe, and, and where you see that uh, heading? It's, it's been a subject of some uh, domestic discord in, in individual countries and sort of community discord about how to handle uh, what China offers and what China might ask for what it offers uh, in those countries. Well, it really is a moment of, of flux right now in perceptions, I think, and it's been uh, crystallized in some ways by China's response uh, to COVID. But I, I think what we've seen over the past two or three years is a real shift, um, largely at the European elite level and really across the continent in perceptions uh, about how benign or whether a BRI is in fact a benign project. I think uh, a couple of years ago, the consensus in Europe was, at least for Europe, it was benign. It offered investment. Maybe there were problems for countries that were closer to China, but uh, for Europe, it was only a good thing. Today, I think the view in Europe has shifted really quite drastically. Um, and it's, it's a shift that's taken uh, some time to materialize, but I think is really now widespread and in some ways uh, irreversible. Uh, a couple of data points just from the past couple of weeks to illustrate this. Um, one is the UK's decision to reverse course on Huawei participation in UK 5G networks uh, just this week, uh, which is, I think, a very interesting data point. The UK made one decision and then changed its mind uh, in part because of COVID. Um, but the UK decision is actually more interesting because it was driven by domestic politics. The prime minister wanted to do one thing and backbenchers demanded another. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a sort of a movement across Europe's political elites to force their governments to adopt a tougher line on China. If you look at German debate, you see uh, very much the same thing. Angela Merkel is in some ways a real outlier for being pro-Chinese among German political elites, and anyone who would succeed her would be at the very least slightly more hawkish to really substantially more hawkish on the question of China. And that's true in, that's true in different political parties as well. It's not just the center-right. The Greens are in some ways more hawkish on China for human rights issues. Uh, and is the German center-right. And even when you look at those countries that have historically 
uh, at least issued public statements saying that they were closer to China on the Belt and Road or more amenable to Belt and Road investment. Italy, Greece, uh, we mentioned Serbia before, which is not an EU member state, but would like to be one. I think you're also seeing a shift there. Uh, these are countries that obviously have uh, a greater need for foreign investment than do Germany or the UK. So there is some incentive to turn to China for foreign investment purposes. But you've also seen a big shift in the business community and the political elite uh, that involves more skepticism about the benefits of China's investment. In Greece, I think we can certainly say that I had China if the Prius deal was happening today, it wouldn't go through either at the Greek level or at the European wide level. And when I look at uh, Italian political, political parties signing statements about cooperation with the Belt and Road, I again think about the European context for this statement. This is a negotiating uh, tool with, with Brussels, the European Commission, and with Germany about financial support for Europe as much as it is about Italian relations with China. And I think when you zoom out and look at the view in Brussels or any of the European capitals, you find an attitude that's much more skeptical today than it was just a couple of years ago. Um, I just wanted to turn then back to the African case. How do you see BRI uh, playing out in Africa, the reactions uh, to it? I mean, obviously, a lot of the critical accounts from the outside stress the risks of uh, debt trap diplomacy, the, the risks of becoming dependent in various ways on China. So, so how do you see the reception? Do you see it changing over time? What would you see going forward on what has really been the signature uh, agenda item of, of Xi's foreign policy in many ways? I think Ambassador Chen might be muted. Yeah, Ambassador Chen, I think you're muted. I'm gonna, there we go. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me take a, a stab at that historically, although there's not that much history behind the BRI. Uh, Africa is sort of a Johnny-come-lately when it comes to the BRI. I don't think China really understood what they were going to do with Africa. You had the Maritime Silk Road, and you had the issuance of a map that uh, sort of ran a line from China around the northern uh, rim of the Indian Ocean to Mombasa, through the Red Sea to, uh, to the Mediterranean. And that was sort of BRI for Africa. And it, no one knew quite what it meant in Africa. And they certainly didn't know what it meant beyond the northeast corridor of Africa. Uh, the rest of Africa seemed to be not part of it. That changed over time. And increasingly, uh, China realized that it had to bring Africa more directly into the BRI. So it started signing BRI MOUs all across the continent. Last time I checked, there were 40 some MOUs that had been signed with the 54 African countries. Uh, that's all well and good. Uh, but the BRI for Africa is, has really been a formalization of what was going on before. And that is the financing of infrastructure projects uh, throughout the continent. And perhaps there will be an increased number of infrastructure projects in the future as a result of BRI and the money that's going into it. But I don't really see it as anything that's new for Africa. It's simply formalizing past Chinese policy towards Africa and most importantly, when you look at the impact of COVID-19, not only on China's economy, but what's going on in Africa, I just wonder if there isn't going to be a slowdown in the signing of new loan agreements uh, in Africa. We've already seen a, uh, a reduction in signings over the last two or three years. And my guess is this uh, slowdown is going to be uh, exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. If, if I could uh, just pick up where Ambassador Shin uh, left off and, and just pose the larger question because BRI has not only exploded to every uh, continent in the world from the initial maps that were put out and then rescinded, but it is also encompassing much more um, topically. It had previously been a kind of a debt uh, for infrastructure arrangement. Now it has military components, political components, it's got a health silk road, it's got a, uh, a digital silk road, it's got smart cities. And so the question, and then becomes, if BRI is now everything, then what is BRI? It, it sees, in my mind, it is, it is synonymous with Chinese foreign policy. I do not see any uh, light between what BRI has become and, and, and Beijing's foreign policy around the world. And I think that's, um, if, if it's everything, is it nothing? I mean, I think these are kind of maybe philosophical questions that we can think about. Um, but um, what Ambassador Shin says is really interesting because we go back to the Angola uh, deals um, uh, over a decade ago um, where uh, China was using debt uh, 
um, to backed up by the oil. And that seems to have been an arrangement that is uh, certainly comfortable within BRI. Now to get the, um, the, debt, uh, the debt trap issue, I think is, is really important. And I, wanna, I really wanna stress this. It has essentially evolved into an irrelevancy because China is now making direct equity purchases for uh, what it wants, right? Um, what is a debt trap? Well, a debt trap means that you have debt and you convert it into equity stakes, essentially, where you have direct ownership. But that's not even necessary if you just go in and buy the direct equity. So the entire question of the debt trap has essentially been rendered irrelevant. China neither has nor does not have a debt trap um, because China wants to get paid back. Um, the idea of a trap means you want them to fall into it. I, I think China's idea was always that it wished to be paid back for its uh, uh, loans. And there was never an idea of, uh, we hope they won't pay us back, so we'll be able to X, Y, and Z. So I, I really want to stress to listeners um, that are with us that I think the whole debt trap issue has not only been blown out of proportion, but is essentially not important, um, at least a, as it relates uh, to Africa. Um, and uh, I guess... Oh, there was one other thing, but of course I can't read my own writing. Oh, um, no, with the with the issue of um, the riskiness, um, you know, in in our interviews that Ambassador Shin and I did, and I won't be specific because you'll have to buy the book, but there was um, uh, plenty of interviews we did in 2017 and 18 where uh, people who were in charge of these things were saying we're not we're a little concerned about our ability to get paid back or um, in terms of our um, uh, equity investments, um, our due diligence has not been as thorough as we really thought it would be. Um, and so I do think that that has gradually led to a more risk averse attitude. And then of course the, the, uh, the crisis we find ourselves in is, is uh, certainly a big blow as well. So, but I think that this is a, a trend that had already been ongoing and therefore um, it's interesting to see that the impact of COVID, but of course, on um, the last FOCAC meeting, um, China did not increase its total amount of, um, uh, of funding, or I should say finance into Africa. So what's interesting and what listeners should stay tuned for is the next FOCAC meeting and to look at the numbers that come out of that. Um, and China is going to be under a lot of pressure to at least not see those numbers dip. But um, I have hard pressed, and I'd be curious to uh, know what others think, but I'm hard pressed to see those numbers going up rapidly or China putting, uh, you know, doubling them as it had been doing in the past. Right, I think it's an absolutely fair point that uh, this notion that the BRI was either a debt trap or was a fully worked out strategy is, is just silly. There, there's very little support that. Uh, but at the end of the day, you wind up with some of the same concerns, which is a huge Chinese economic presence uh, in countries with limited resources and desperate infrastructure need. Uh, and so it becomes, you know, the, the concern is through whatever mechanism, uh, an economic uh, lever to be used to uh, political ends. We're really coming up against uh, the end of our time, but I want to give Ambassador Shin the last word uh, to particularly address the <coughs> question of what all of this means for, <coughs> excuse me, U.S.-China roles in Africa. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the area that the Chris was talking about initially, it's you know, Russia-China, where you would think rivalry, but there's been a kind of alignment. It's always been a complex relationship. Uh, what about uh, Africa, where in some sense, at this point, the U.S. is the, the other, still the other major outside player. Sure. The uh, policy of the Trump administration on, on Africa today is, is largely to, um, to compete with both China and Russia. Now, quite frankly, Russia is not a major player in Africa today, so I, I won't get into that at all. It, it's just not that meaningful. But China is. And the, if the idea is to compete with China and Africa, uh, you have to d define how you're going to do it and, and what is the goal of it. Uh, there have been some efforts to do that by the administration uh, in that we, we have now, finally, the resurrection of the Export-Import Bank after having been in limbo for a number of years. Uh, that's a, a, a positive. Uh, we also have this new uh, International Development Finance Corporation, uh, part of the, the BUILD Act, which is uh, re replaces the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That's a positive development. That could lead to new investment, American investment in Africa, and that's a good thing. But in the final analysis, it's the American private sector that will decide to either go into Africa or not. And the incentives that are provided by the Export-Import Bank and the BUILD Act uh, may help, but I, I don't see that making a huge difference. And while all of that is happening, 
you have trade between the U.S. and Africa actually declining in recent years. In fact, it's declined significantly, mainly because we import so little oil from Africa anymore. But even our exports to Africa are flat at best. So we're trying to compete with China, uh, but without the tools, really, or at least with very few tools. And I'm not sure where that gets us. Uh, it seems to me that what we need to do is is show that we are the better partner for Africa and let the Africans choose for themselves whether they want to deal with us or whether they want to deal with China. And my guess is they're going to pick and choose. They're going to deal with China on certain things and with the U.S. on others, uh, the U.S. particularly on security issues. Uh, so I, I think there are some, there are some, issues, there are some problems with this, uh, this approach. Um, thank you so much. This has been an extremely uh, rich discussion. I think it has uh, gotten into uh, hugely interesting and important issues about uh, China's relationship with a very large uh, swath of the world. Uh, and it has connected with our, our theme of those things which lie between soft power attractiveness. And I think we've heard from all of our speakers, the Chinese model is not you know, drawing a lot of soft power points uh, in, in any of these uh, countries at the moment. It's got some, but it's, it's not in the strong suit and we're not anywhere near the realm of coercion. So we're in this, this mix of economic incentives and uh, the attempts to bring political pressure to bear diplomatically and, and otherwise. And it interacts with the domestic politics of policy toward China and other places. I think we had a rich discussion of that. I urge you to turn in tomorrow, tune in tomorrow when we will explore some of those same issues in a slightly different context of mostly China's united front work uh, in its relatively uh, near abroad, Japan uh, and elsewhere in Asia, uh, plus, plus well, one, one speaker, Toshi Oshara, will focus on the United Front Work Department itself. Uh, so that's the next installment in our rich tour here. Uh, I hope and trust that it will be as terrific as today's was, and I want to thank Ambassador David Chin, Professor Joshua Eisenman, and Professor Chris Miller, our own FDRI colleague, uh, for joining us uh, and all the audience too for, for sticking with us and for putting up some really interesting questions. I only wish my backdrop were as good as Ambassador Chin's. I <laughs> uh, thank you all and I hope to see you uh, tomorrow and Friday. Roger. Thank, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this was uh, a, once again a terrific discussion and I do hope you uh, uh, we'll come back and join our conversation tomorrow when, as, as Jacques uh, mentioned, we'll be pivoting back to East Asia and looking at China's uh, political warfare activities in that region. Uh, please check us out online, www.fpri.org. Consider becoming a member if you're not already and considering, consider including Orbis in, in your membership because it's a terrific publication. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. In the meantime, Stay safe, take care of yourselves and your family, and we'll see you. Take care. Thank you.